Mike not working? Yeah, Mike's not working. Oh, no,
Okay, uh, what is the uh, optimal situation or uh, method that you have for attracting students and keeping them engaged? Yes, Sarah, let's start with you. Okay, first one for the Yacht Club. We focus on our local area. We're located in Lake Ontario. Uh, we look for basically anyone that has a love for water. We found that many people who even live in the area don't know that they can go learn to sail from us. So we've done a lot of promotion through our city as well as through U.S. Sailing to become like people. We have an uh, added bonus of being the only U.S. Sailing school on Lake Ontario in the Rochester area. So if someone wants to learn to sail, they come to us. And I think one of our main ways to get that word out is through social media and print media. So we use both those on our website to attract people sort of sell them on our first program and hope that we stick around for it. Well, I'm still struggling to find the best way to advertise in this new world of social media and websites and what really works. Um, most of our students come to us from word of mouth, just driving by, a few finders on, online, but basically your best customers are happy customers. So making sure that your students come to your program, have a positive experience, and go out and spread the word, we've really found that that is your best, best option for attracting new students. And so I'm here to learn, and I've learned a lot this week, about social media and how to do better with all of that and figure out how to utilize that. I hope you've had an opportunity to do that as well. Um, um, I'll echo uh, what um, uh, Matt and Sarah said. Uh, our business, which is commercial enterprise, the metropolitan area of San Francisco Bay, um, uh, we spend well, a sickening amount of money on advertising that didn't work over the first 25 years of our business. Um, because we're local, um, we stopped advertising under you know, the normal chains. Sorry, Salem World, Cruising World, I know you're in the room. Um, and uh, uh, the reason was that we, uh, our metrics weren't supported. What we did find was that uh, this new way of communicating in social media uh, was where everybody's eyeballs were. And um, interestingly enough, because it was digital um, and, and it was um, interesting and vibrant and things moved and you had videos and, and, and things you just couldn't do with print um, advertising, uh, it was much more engaging to the would-be sailor. And, and if, if you're thinking about um, engaging new sailors, you need to think of them as a would-be sailor. They haven't, they may not have sailed before, uh, they may not have even been on a boat. Something's got in their head that says some love of the water or, or seeing the boats on San Francisco Bay or, or seeing a picture of a boat someplace that's got them excited. But they aren't sailors and, um, and you need to reach them in the places where they are because Often they're, they're um, not um, in the magazines. We have a magazine that I'm really fond of, Latitude 38, and, um, and it is a wonderful tool for the sailing community, but it's a big claim to fame for its advertising is 85% of our readers own boats. Well, for a community program or a commercial operation like mine, you're looking for folks who don't own boats. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your advertising. You really want to segment. Yes, sir. <coughs> One of the things we've just started using in our club is an organization called meetup.com. Now, there are various meetup groups around the uh, area. I don't know how far out they go, but one of the things that they do that we found is beneficial to us is you might have a, a rock climbing meetup group, and we might put our sailing group on there. Uh, they might be. Um, like a French language speaking group, those postings that they have, they also post other groups that might interest the other people. So all of a sudden, our meetup for a sailing group is shown on a rock climbing group, or on a bicycling group, or some other group that's away from what we do, but we're finding that we get people saying, hey, I saw you on meetup the other day. Is there one from that, that site before? Meetup? Meetup.com. Yeah, we use Meetup, and, um, and it, it's, it definitely fits in that category of one of the good tools to use, um, uh, uh, but uh, recognize that it will be 
uh, peripheral to your success. Um, uh, and it's a long-term way to build visibility and brand. It's, um, it's really hard to use Meetup to get butts in seats in that same season. True. I didn't find that to be true. We did a Buffalo Meetup group in 2013 and sold 54 seats in two and a half weeks. We'll run another one um, on February 12th. What kind of program? Uh, we are a paper selling club with 450 members, and we were looking for crew members. So the program we put together, we had 15 skippers to volunteer their boats. We put four people on each boat, and we had three crew members, a Forest Harbor member and a skipper. Um, on Saturday mornings from 9 to 1 for five consecutive weeks from May to June, the um, participants would get a 45-minute dockside session and an on-the-water experience. We sold it for $50, which is basically a crew membership for our paper club, and of those 54 people, four never showed up, but thank you for your check. Um, and another 38 from permanent places on boats. Our acid test we felt would be what the sign up was going to be for 2014. Um, our membership application has just went out last week, so I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you that without any advertising, we already have 23 sign ups for the Discover Buffalo Salmon program for 2014. For me, very That's successful. Great. That's great. So what works one place may not work another, and may work in triple spades another place. Um, is there anything more important than training at your school? Um, uh, uh, another lesson for our program was um, uh, because both my business partner and I were um, sailing instructors, um, we looked at our entire business through a sailing instructor's lens for the first 15 years of our business. And we had a club, we, we had a sailing school that also had a club. And that's how we viewed it. All of our conversations were informed by that one single belief, that we were a sailing school that had a club. Uh, we didn't really start to grow until we turned that on its head and said, we're a club and the sailing school is a tool to build that club. And that, made a huge difference. Obviously, yacht clubs have you know, figured that out um, um, almost to the exclusion, in some cases, um, uh, for adult training. But, um, but it, was, it was hard for us as, as sailing school wonks to get our heads around the fact that um, people said they wanted training, but really what they wanted was community and something to, to fill the heart. And, uh, and once we learned that lesson, uh, we doubled our business in five years. Our school still is a school and we have a really small club and the people who join the club are, as Rich said, looking for community and getting involved. Um, most of our students, we really hope that they will have the opportunity to test out sailing, to see what it's all about, and then go on and participate at the local yacht clubs or buy a boat or find a friend that they can give you a little bit of rental, not a lot of rental. Um, so that always becomes an issue. If I take this class, can I rent the boats? Well, yes, at a certain point we can. Um, it's something that we need to work on. But people do want to have the opportunity to, when they learn the to, to go out and the sale. Obviously, Yes, I'm going to agree with both of them, the actual community and also a good follow-up. Uh, people come to learn to sail, but they don't want to leave once they learn at our yacht club because we're running on places with boats that they could access. Um, so one of the things we take time to do with our lessons in the yacht club sense is after the lesson is over, our instructor invites them back to the club to uh, hang out for a half an hour to an hour. And then that gives the instructor a chance to sort of nitpick and see why the person is here to learn how to sail so they can follow up and keep them moving on the direction they're looking to go in. And that seems to be really helpful. That's where our repeat uh, lesson takers come for and people that's kind of joining the club because they realize beyond learning how to sail, they can now turn this skill into a passion, and that's something we really push for because we want them to catch that bug, stay here, learn how to sail, use our boats, buy a boat, 
and become a part of our family. So it's worked very well in that we just take extra time once they've done the classroom course to figure out why they're here and figure out why we can keep them here. So, so my, uh, my conviction is that people will keep on sailing as long as they're learning and as long as they're socially connected. So, what's the fear that, yes? Yeah, we're a uh, back but we're looking for new Just um, a couple of quick resources, um, uh, especially in Connecticut. Um, Stu, um, who's staff member, um, um, uh, head of the training department right now, um, longtime community sailing volunteer, um, executive director of the community sailing program, and knows the Northeast um, sailing corridor like the back of his hand, so please ask him. Another good resource for everybody else is Katie Neubauer, who is the community sailing committee chair. And uh, she's also, um, um, she came from Burlington, is that right? Mm -hmm. or she came from Burlington, Vermont, and uh, uh, she's down in the um, Newport area now, but she knows all of the 350 community sailing programs around there. That's good, so let's uh, check in with our audience here. Uh, how many of you are mainly yacht club, sailing club based? Community sailing based. A smaller number. How many uh, school, other kind of school, other formats? Tell me a format. Like, like commercial, what? Sailing. commercial sailing, yeah. Commercial sailing club and training facility. sailing programs, schools, and yacht clubs. Yacht clubs are usually looking for members, and these learn-to-sail-based places are a terrific source. Uh, and creating a culture of learning within the yacht club is uh, easy to action. One, one brief comment. Yes. Uh, our yacht club, we have lots of members, but a lot of other clients, and we have empty slips. And so my interest is figuring out ways to get 
a large membership out of the water. And it sounds like perhaps partnering with uh, the Salem uh, centers is the way to go, although we don't have a big supply of that either. And where is it located? South Texas, Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi, okay. And, and how far from Lakewood is that? Uh, 18 hours by sailboat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ran into that one. Two, 200 miles. miles. <laughs> 200 miles, okay. Yeah. Because then there's a, a bevy of um, instructors up there that could be trucked down to teach folks. Yes? So I run a community center, a community sailing program, and one of the things that happened in the, in the, within the program, the sailors, I, they're all Indians. They decided um, we wanted to con continue on a keelboat. So what they did was they uh, came together with the, the Mystic Seaport and said, hey, let's become a club, Anderson Island Club. They don't have a clubhouse, they don't have anything. But what they did was they bought three keelboats. Then they got the people who were in my sailing program to become members, volunteer for the seaport, pay for dues, and then they take them out on keelboats. So that would be a great way to do kind of like take people from the and, and the seaport gives them free slips when they come in. So there's their perks to it. We've got a little bit of that. We've got three IC 24s on the local Sea Scout ship uh, maintains them for us. So we've even got boats that our members can take out and they still sit in the slips. So I've got to figure a way to, you know, get the diners out on the water and get their passion for sailing built. Get some more members who are not diners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you want to try this, but one of the things you can try is someone who does sail, try to convince them to take people out and just really talk them up when they're eating their thing. You should just give it a try. Uh, we actually tried that recently, and usually you get the younger people, but then once I went to <coughs> some older people who probably been members of the club for years now, and they were like, okay, we'll try. They went out on a boat, I think it was a 40 foot boat, and they just Loved it. I mean, it wasn't necessarily inspired them to go out the boat, but it inspired them to go out more often was this one key step there. Um, and it's just, you have to hope that you have some members there that are just as eager to see more people on boats. And once you find them, they're going to go and say, yeah, come on my boat, let's go. You know, Friday night, just go out or go in their races and go watch them. Uh, just use the boats as a social method. So they're not going out to a sail or race, they're just going out to go be with people, and that can really catch the, their buzz for them. And then they'll say, oh, we can take these folks out if we know how to sail, and then they'll do it themselves. So they kind of return the favor. Thank you. Serve dinner on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll just add, uh, statistically, um, uh, about 10% 10, 10 of people who take a formal sailing lesson have never been on a boat before. Seventy-five percent have had a, a single positive experience on a boat. Only about five percent who have a crappy experience but showed up anyway. <laughs> Those are the wonderful members, but just keep in mind that if you can make that first attempt <clears throat> pleasurable for them, the odds are huge that they will come back for a second and a fifth and a twelfth. Get them integrated as best you can 
through the lessons and past the lessons. And then the second question was, uh, what are your training goals? We do ideally teams and sonars. Uh, we prefer our sonar for most of our lessons because it has a, it's more stable and has more space for teaching on. But in a small lesson, a one-on-one -on -one lesson, the ideally teams work really well. And also for more advanced training, because we offer private and refresher lessons, if someone wants to learn how to throw a spinnaker, we always do it on our ideally teams, you know, just to give them that. that because that's also one of our race fleet boats that we have out three days a week racing. definitely noticed that as well. Um, all of our instructors are members, so they have the same passion to get people into our club. And we were talking about how we were able to get people to come down. And they're like, well, let's just have a day. We'll take all the boats out. We'll take anyone that wants to go out. You know, no charge, nothing. We'll just be there because we want people on our boats. And with that sort of passion from your instructors or even just your members that like taking people out, they give you the opportunity to really open up your club. And that really helps. <coughs> You've all heard of summer sales tips, right? I'm, I'm going I'm to give a plug for John Art and his summer sales tips project just because if you're needing a day and if you're looking for a place, there's nothing like free food, free sailing, free anything to bring people in to get them to come take a look. So for a couple hundred dollars, a few hot, bar, hot dogs on the barbecue, invite the public down. And we have done it for the last couple of years, and each year it has grown. And by making it summer solstice, which is the Saturday in June, closest to summer solstice this year, I think it's June 22nd, you make your program part of a bigger program. And so if you need a date, that's, that's a good one. So, yeah. I'm just wondering in the follow up, have you ever thought about your membership rather than those 40 people and giving them limited access? If you've ever thought about, after taking X amount of lessons, giving them full access as a member? and see if they really get into it, how many might sign up a second on their own dime. We actually offer um, clubhouse privileges once they take a lesson for the entire entirety of their lesson, which is usually two to three weeks. Um, and that usually gives them the opportunity. We've had, we don't see people being completely comfortable doing that unless the instructor invites them to something. Um, but beyond that, we always have that hesitation of having summer members because we're Rochester and they just feel so invasive. So we try to make sure that it's not the entirety, but we definitely invite them as much as we can. And I think that their temporary membership that they received gives the opportunity. If they really want to look into this yacht club, they're going to take the time to do it. So um, I'm, I'm, most of my sailing has been racing. And um, I have to say that as a racer, we are pretty bad at introducing people sailing because you know how we do it I mean think about taking up skiing right how many people do you know who were taking skiing given a 15 minute drill and then entered in a downhill race right but what do we do we get the guy come on out and sail with me okay this is the boat that's the jib that's the thing and this is how we tack and oh there's the five minute gun <laughs> really? And they're going to come back? You know, there's a special person that survives that and becomes a sailor. <laughs> which leads to the next question, which is, uh, what do you feel is the biggest fear of the newbie in, before they sign up or in the, in the thinking about, am I going to sign up? Um, people statistically are more afraid of public speaking than they are of driving their car off of a cliff, and it's the same fear that they have in sailing. 
They say they're afraid of getting hurt, they're afraid that the boat's healing. All of that is actually uh, the, the human minds trying inadequately to express how terrified they are of looking stupid. So uh, everything you do, whether it's bringing in members in a non-training area or bringing in students in a training area, you have to drive the fear, the performance fear, the fear of failure out of your program. And that's why, you know, that's why Tom's comment was so apropos. It's impossible to do that in a race. <laughs> You just can't unless you say, okay, we're just going to follow the fleet, and, uh, and if we are in the race, but we're not going to be competitive, you might be able to have that newbie have a good time. But, but figure out in the boat ride or the um, promotion or the meetup group or whatever else, make sure that that first <coughs> session or two are completely choreographed for their needs and not yours. If you're the skipper of that boat, the only joy you should be getting out of it is getting a smile on their face. And, and I can't emphasize that enough. Well, I think anyone who comes in and is contemplating taking a lesson with you, they've all gotten themselves there. So now it's up to you to get into their head and help them realize that it's really their own dream that they want to follow. And so no matter whether it's mermaid or swimming or whatever it is that's keeping them from doing it, it's time to do it. You're here now. You've made the decision to stop by. And what is your dream? What is your ultimate goal with your sailing? Why are you here? And if you can have that conversation in a you know, forward move, moving trajectory, you will actually get someone to join you and participate, at least at one level of sailing. Whether they continue to do it, that depends on their experience and their wallet and their schedules. And, and for us, scheduling and people's well, something better is going to come up, I'm not going to commit, is just the biggest hurdle right now. People are busy, people have busy lives, people have kids, soccer gets in the way, the snow is falling finally. You know, there are so many things, you know, fun that's asking for people's time and money that, you know, making it affordable, making it accessible, making it flexible is, is really where you need to be going with your program and just... Do you have a question for her? Um, Question, having done all that and got your person on board, how do you retain them? Um, I think that one of the things you have to figure out is uh, how comfortable they are in that lesson. You want to make sure that that's the best experience from on and off. And one of the things that one of our instructors pointed out to me was I constantly ask them if they're comfortable, and if they say they're not, I ask them why not. And then I explain to them how they can fix it. If a boat's healing too much, I just say, oh, well, then we have to do this and they fix the boat from healing. And I think that once you kind of knock out that initial fear and they realize that it can be difficult, but they can do it by just giving them the filler for that moment, they start to see that they can actually sail. I mean, when I was learning how to sail, which was not too long ago, you know, I was like, no, because if I lose control, I won't be able to stop it and won't get back to the dock and I'm gonna look stupid. And then I realized, you know, once you think it through, you can do this. And when you realize you can do it, you either decide you love it and you'll just keep doing it. And that's when they come back. Because you go from being like, I can do it, to being like, I really like doing it. And you have to find those people and see how you can convince them that they like doing it. Yeah, one of the things that I found early on when I was teaching, you find real quickly, the first thing that, fear, that put the fear in them was when the boat started to heal. And I'm a big believer on getting them on the boat soon. Do a real quick, real quick talk. Get them on the boat and sail. But two or three times when I do the talk, I'll say, remember now, this boat is like a cork. It's going to heel over. It's going to lean. But all you have to do is release the sail. It, it's got the big fin on the bottom. It's going to stand you right back up. Don't, and, I, and I say it a couple of times at the beginning, so it's not a surprise to them when it starts to heal. I definitely think that helps if they know that it could happen and they already know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. so and, then, think about it. and then do it. Yeah. You know, do it right away. And then say we can do it, stop it when, anytime we want. There's a, there's a sailing school in the Erie, Pennsylvania. I heard a guy talking about a school. In the, it's actually a high school an extension for kids who are in the heap of trouble. And these kids come in and they've got the attitude and punched the principal for the third time and got kicked out and sent to this program. And they're, they're tough guys, you know, and they get on the boat, and the first time the boat heals, 
their children again. <laughs> and he's got them. We use uh, J24s. <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the key with the boats that you have is to consider whether you'd want the um, support and structure and curriculum of the U.S. Sailing Keelboat Program. And uh, Karen Davidson can talk to you about that. Um, and uh, you can either get some of your members certified as instructors, or you can bring in, you know, higher U.S. Sailing certified instructors. But uh, yeah, with the boats you have. Uh, you have a wonderful opportunity to get those new sailors just over the hump so they're comfortable enough with the equipment and the healing and the, and the chaos. And uh, then you can introduce them to racing and, and they find it an adventure rather than um, terrorizing. I'm going to make a pitch here for certified instructors. Um, because if we were, uh, we're all grown ups and I bet you've all been on the board of something and there's a liability issue. So you want instructors who have been certified so that you can get the insurance plan that goes to cover your, your program and it's important. Sailing centers. We have several. And the, and the Little Red Book is, uh, to clarify, Little Red Book is for small boat sailing right. um, and is, is a, a, a badge of accomplishment that's aimed at youth. 
It's not a certificate to rent boats, never was intended to be, but um, um, uh, uh, without, I hope I don't um, you know, singe anybody's um, eyebrows with this, but if you have a US sailing keel boat certification, then you will be a better sailor than three quarters of the people in other commercial programs that are not US sailing certified. And the most um, evolved of those charter club business owners know that and are looking for um, uh, more students. The le less secure ones in this non-US sailing world um, will pound their chest and say, you know, our standards are very high, US sailing doesn't mean anything, but it's really just a, a, a competitive canard. certifications um, we offer courses that you can take the track of certification and you can take the track of no certification um, what is taught and the standards are the same whether you go one way or the other but some people work much better better when they have an ultimate goal or an exam or some test that they need to pass and that's where the US sailboat or US keeling US sailing keelboat certification comes in is there are students who really just want the challenge of, I can pass this. And for them, it's if I want to go charter somewhere else, this will help me cross some hurdles and I have, don't have to start all over again. Um, for other students, it's just a matter of, hey, I want to learn this, I want to have fun, I don't want the stress of taking a test. And so making sure that you have equal options is, is sometimes a good idea. Sarah, So because of our situation in the boats that we have, we teach U.S. sailing up to basic keelboat as well as coastal navigation, but those are the only U.S. sailing classes we can currently offer based on our resources because we don't have a cruising boat and we don't have a great location for cruising to teach. So what we've done, and it's really through the creativity of your instructors, you really need to bounce back with them, we have an intermediate refresher course which allows people who haven't sailed in a while or do sail and they have a specific thing they want to work on, or they just want to be back on a boat and do, they don't want to learn, they want to sail with someone. That's one of our best offers. We can give to someone who says, I already know how to sail, I want to go on a boat, I just want to do it again. So we offer our, we call it a refresher course, and we used to kind of have a curriculum for it, but I really leave it open-ended to the students coming in, so they can say, this is what I want to do, what can you do for me? And it's worked really well, because it, it gives people that chance of practice a skill, or just become a better sailor. Uh, we're also looking into, we have an intro to race classroom course because as he also mentioned, we're a very heavily racing club and we want more people to do it. So one of our resources was this classroom course and we started looking at what we have and we have a 26 foot Pearson and we said, let's just send it out there on a race course with an instructor and teach them how to race. So we're building that program as well so it becomes that next step. They learned how to sail, they did basic heel boat, and now they can either go, if they want to go cruising, we are more than happy to tell them where to go next. You know, we have to, you have to charter, you have to leave Rochester to do that. We don't have charter boats up here. And, they, and they're okay, that, and they usually take coastal navigation from us to do that, so that they're prepared. And if they choose the racing aspect, we're not gonna feed them right through all of our programs. We have lots of feeder programs for that. Uh, we don't have a huge non-member crew, crew option because our boats don't have a big crew issue, they just pick their people and they stick with them. So this gives them that chance they're going to learn how to race. They're going to say, I want to do it. They, we have a women's race association they can join. We have a new league, it's called Sunday Fun Day. Uh, it's, we want to learn how to race, we know how to sail, and we want to go out without people criticizing us or calling us that we're in their way. So it's a completely non-competitive racing option. So we've created these feeder programs with our instructors to increase levels of skills beyond what U.S. sailing classes are. And it kind of just keeps people coming back, which is what we're looking for. And it also gives our members something to do because they already know how to sail or they have been on boats for so long they don't think they need to take learn to sail. So they're going to go straight up to, you know, an intermediate course, get their sea legs back and get back into sail.
recruiting and sharing about your junior sailing program. If you have a junior sailing program that's open to the public, um, a lot of parents really start taking an interest in junior sailing to say, well, you know, my kids can do it. You know, maybe that's something I can do, or maybe that's something I'd like to do. So our, our adult sailing class is almost entirely composed of non-members who are parents of junior sailors that are already outside of the program. And 75% of those are women. So, um, like, mothers who um, have kids in your program, that's a huge, huge uh, audience that you can draw from. And, uh, you know, they're, and they, they really enjoy it, and they control in our class every summer. Resource. And of course, again, that will depend on how open your club is to, to that sort of thing. But if they allow that, go for it. But you mentioned something really important, and that's the women in your club. And I know, anyone from your club have a yacht club there? Um, they've done a tremendous job with the ladies, and they do one bit on the stag, on the stag this weekend. They do a girls weekend at the yacht club. And so they bring in great coaching. They have lots of fun events, lunches, dinners. And so engage your female membership that way, have events for them. I know at the end of the summer, they do an all-girls stag cruise, where they actually take the girls on the cruise and boat, and their male members hesitantly allow them to take their boats. And you know, it's all run, and all the men hang out in Avalon and wait for the call to come fix the generator when the, dryer won't, when the hair dryer won't work. But they have a tremendous weekend on the water socializing. So just a, just a thought. <laughs> yes. one, of, one of the things that uh, we've noticed in our summer camps is we have what we call a little pop to the five to uh, seven year old and it's a half day camp. Well, when the mom comes and drops the kids off, they stay. They're not going to go off. And so they stay. And uh, we had several of them have, why don't they have a summer camp, a mommy camp? Yeah. And so this year we're going to implement mommy camp. And family sailing, so you got yeah. kids and parents, like, you know, out on the boat together, uh, you know, a couple nights a week. Like we have a barbecue every Thursday night. And you get parents and kids out on, on the day on the board together. Like it's just, I think that family aspect is really important to keeping keeping things together um, and keeping people support. Right. I'm curious how long um, members are members, and when they uh, when they leave, why do they leave? Um, so, um, as a commercial entity, um, we put a lot of time and statistical research into that, and, um, and we we average um, in our sailing club probably in the you know ten year range for our mean, and um, and we have some members that we've had for almost all thirty years, and, and other members who um, are members for two years and go by boat, uh, uh, but. We found that um, making that mean line go up from, you know, when we started it was probably two years or three years, um, is all based on um, uh, um, you know, two words really, I think confidence and aspiration. And so everything that we do in our business, we ask, does it increase our clients or our members' confidence as sailors, or even in the social environment? Because as a club, you're responsible for their social welfare as well as you are in their social welfare. And also, is there enough stuff there so that they really feel like this is the place they can make all their dreams come true? And sometimes it's advanced training. Um, sometimes it's um, uh, flotillas to Thailand. Uh, but um, there's lots of opportunities to create uh, things that have people looking ahead two years, three years, five years down the road about how their relationship with your organization is going to evolve. Um, so we, we've been having trouble, um, I guess, the dynamic between kids and adults, where kids are very open to doing a class more than once to get to a certain level, and they're OK with the failure, whereas our adults expect, despite simply showing us that they're going to reach that level within the time frame of our class. And, um, I guess I'd just like to know how you deal with the frustration in adding classes to get to a certain level and giving those people to continue to know that it doesn't happen in that time frame. Well, it, it is a matter of managing expectations. And if you have members who are coming in and actually agree to take a class, I think you've taken a big step. 
if you have pub public students who come in who've never taken a class before, it's a lot easier. Um, for a person who's sailed before and who thinks they know everything, it is very difficult to manage expectations. And I think that goes back to if you have a certified sailing instructor, they know how to deal that, with that because they've already been in the class and if part of their education was working with their peers and managing their expectations. So the criticism sandwich always comes in really, really handy. But your programming matters too. So if you have a level one class and a level two class and a level three class, I think depending on where they are, it's, it's easy for them to see that this is the progression of where you will go. You take this class and you'll naturally take this class. We often get the student who calls and will have sailed for 30 years and they learned to sail in college, but in reality they haven't sailed in 20 years, and so what do they really remember? Sometimes encouraging them to take a private lesson, go out on the water with an instructor, go through some of the drills that they would in the class. Sometimes it's easier for them to be realistic with themselves at that point when they get back, back on the water with someone who throws drills at them and say, hey, let's try, let's try anchoring. How are we doing on tacking, diving, all of those things? And after they get out and they do it, and they realize, okay, well, maybe I'll start at level two rather than level three. And so having that progression and that opportunity to do that sometimes works really well. I got a quick comment on that, too. We use uh, a method that U.S. Sailing has implemented for instructors. Nobody fails our class, they have a plan of improvement. Right, so exactly. They, if they don't, so don't use that failure word, use a plan You never fail, you just need to work on something. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. and, and it's great because now you have someone that's been in a group lesson that has moved on into a private lesson. Jeff, I'll just uh, quickly offer that um, if, uh, uh, whether it's a child or an adult, they show up in a class and they expected to get their certificate because they fogged the mirror, it's because um, the work well in advance wasn't done. Like the Coast Guard says, when there are collisions or casualties at sea, it's never the last thing that happens. It's the four or five things before that. So really think about your education, your marketing training, and make sure that every step of the way you're being really clear with people what the commitment is, um, how rigorous it is, and, um, and, and be careful of um, marginalizing the challenge to try and make it sound more fun. Secretly, everybody's looking for challenge. As long as they feel like they're not gonna be made an idiot of, then they want challenge. So you'll find that the harder you make it sound, the more excited they will be to sign up. Are you asking um, which is the most attractive demographic to try and bring in through training? Which, which demographic is responding to that as and showing interest and following through and actually translating into membership? Mm. Well, at, at, on the commercial level, um, um, when the economy is really bad, um, our clients' hair on average gets much whiter. And when the economy is good, our clients get really young. Just went through that this, this session, and um, and you know, right now we're we're flooded with thirty somethings when you know, we couldn't you know we couldn't give a membership away to a thirty something in two thousand nine. Um, uh, but um, um, you know the people who tend to be there the longest are folks who have a settled life. You know they're in the middle or later.
later stages of their career. Their kids are, you know, adolescents are in their teens, and um, and it's much easier for them to have a long-term relationship with sailing, whereas 30-somethings uh, might be two months away from being, you know, transferred to England. So I'll first start by saying there's a, a, in my opinion, there's a jerk rock minimum amount of time, especially for new sailors, that they should have a, be connected to the instructor in the boat. And uh, we've set that at two days so, you know, for a weekend. Um, I think the better training is Monday through Friday, if you will, um, for lack of a better choice, but, but five days in a row. More than that is hard for a whole variety of logistical reasons, not the least of which is after five full days of sailing, um, most new sailors are emotionally and intellectually done. They're happy, they're satisfied, but they are pretty tired. So um, uh, I don't think anything more than five days, especially for entry level or uh, mid, you know, intermediate training. But you know, at least starting off with is really hard to to do the what had used to be very popular, you know, three hours on Saturday for eight Saturdays in a row. It really uh, uh, you can get the job done, but it's inefficient because. You lose momentum, and then you have to start up, and then you stop, and then you start, and then you stop. So, so in advanced training, that can actually work really well because they're already engaged and they're learning differently. You're probably coaching them more than you're instructing them. So, uh, at advanced levels, you can get away with short, intensive bursts of training uh, that pay off. But at the beginning, not, not so much. Well, being a college, we, we do the long stretch. We've gone from eight-week classes to five-week classes, but really on an annual basis, we do a variety of formats because a school teacher really can't take a sailing class in the middle of winter, but we really like to take the Monday through Friday session during the summer. And the mom who wants to take a sailing class but needs to go watch soccer on Saturdays really can't do a Saturday-Sunday. So we have a five-week Saturday session, a five-week Sunday session, and we do some evening classes during the summer. So it's really figuring out what seems to work with your clientele. More than anything we've seen recently that someone will sign up, it's like, okay, I think I can do five Saturdays. Well, it turns out that you know they're gonna miss one or two sessions. So is your system flexible enough that they could take the class on Sundays if you're offering the class on Sundays? You know, are you willing to allow them to switch in and out of days and sessions that they're in and make up their time sometimes? And so it's, it really is figuring out what, what your population of students is all about. And we have, we use Lido's, we use Harbor 20's, we use Shields. Um, people can pick the boats that they want to start on. The Lido classes are group lessons. The instructor's not in the boat with them, they coach from the launch, um, which takes away the Coast Guard requirement when you're teaching. You know, the boats don't have engines, so there is no Coast Guard requirement. But if you're teaching on a boat with an engine, now you're on the boat, you really have to, put, have to have a Coast Guard license. So, you know, you get into other areas where you need to consider what instructors can I use. And so between scheduling and instructors and boats, there, there's a lot to consider. So for us, we've tried pretty much every kind of scheduling. Uh, I'll break it down for a 12-hour course, which is pretty popular for us. Um, we've tried a lot to accommodate the people coming. Our preferred method is two days a week or three days a week with a break in between each day because we find that they really need time to read the book, especially if they didn't pick it up prior to. So we try to do three hours on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday, or just Monday, Wednesday. So it takes about two weeks given the weather, and the weather in Rochester is pretty terrible to actually complete the course. Um, but we've also had people who want more intensive classes or if we're trying to mock off of a junior sale program, we want to offer it Monday through Friday, right when the kids are already here so that the parents don't need to leave and they don't have these awkward pauses of sometimes I'm sailing but sometimes I'm not there. So we do that and we tried six hour weekend courses, but the feedback from our instructors was it causes burnout and they don't think people are retaining, especially in a beginner class. For the more advanced classes, we can pull it off. 
because they're here, they really like being on the boat, that's why they came back. But a beginner class, it's hard to say that they're actually retaining after four hours. Even if you give them that lunch break, they, they just aren't going to get it all in the weekend. So we try to avoid it, even though you'll find that they want that. You have to kind of convince them that the most they can do on a weekend is three hours a day. So you give them a Saturday, Sunday in a row, and do it again. But we try to not have six hour courses anymore. instructors for adults versus kids? You know, I, I have an 18 year old who taught sailing to adults last summer, so when I told him I was coming here, he says, well, make sure to tell him that adults don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are really good. Um, since mine is an adult only program, I uh, have a tough time with the juxtaposition of the two, but um, uh, we, um, we find that there's the unavoidable uh, prospect of credibility uh, based on age that exists when you bring adults into adult training. So there can be that special 21-year-old who is so engaging and so good at what he or she does that they quickly win those adults over. But first impressions being what they are, it's a high hurdle if a uh, you know, 50-year-old CEO of uh, corporation shows up and, um, and they're you know, shaking hands with an 18 year old kid so it's not fair and I would offer that there's a lot of really talented 18 year old kids that that, that um, CEO should be pleased to learn from but it's a fact of life so we, we are careful to um, uh, not, not uh, age specific but we're, we're, uh, we're careful to avoid hiring um, really young instructors for an adult program um, just because it, it puts them in an unfair position. Um, for us, we have very two separate staffs for our lessons. A, our junior program is made up of mostly children that have already graduated through the program. They're our college kids, they're here for the summer, and they're guaranteed nine weeks of work. So they want to take that option. For our adult program, although we're growing, we just don't have a lot of lessons. We see probably 50 people a summer, you know, 10 sessions. So it's not a job. So the younger, for us, the younger kids don't want that position. So we don't have to explain to them that they might not get listened to and that maybe they're not actually qualified to pass basic field book yet. Um, actually, our instructors for our adult program are all members of our club. They're all highly skilled and they're all retired. So they have the skill, they have that knowledge, and they're looked up to. So for us, we, we've had that separation. We've never said it's a separation that's necessary. But given that you're not guaranteed hours, it's really just a side hobby, we don't have those younger people looking to do it. If we did, we'd invite them to do it with the same expectation that you're going to find out next week when you're teaching the next week. And we need you to be available. So if you have to work, you can't do that for us. So that's how we've worked it out, and we keep we try to keep our instructors as members because we're trying to sell the club, so it really helps. Whereas our juniors instructors are not necessarily members, but they probably did take the program, so they're really going to push this program and encourage their little five-year-old to stay with it. So it, it's just sort of a return to the, for the adults, it's a return to the club that got them so engaged, and for the juniors, it's a return to a program that got them to where they are. Yeah, and the majority of ours are instructors for our adult classes are adults. Um, we have had success using youth instructors with adult classes, and I think the comment from Daniel was more that he, it's easier to engage the kids to not put up barriers and not put up their shield in terms of, oh, I already know that, I don't need to hear that. So it wasn't so much that 
know, you can connect with them. It's more a matter of the kids are more open-minded than adults are in terms of how they learn and why they want to learn. So, you know, having someone that can break through that is, is really important and you figure out what works for you or what you have availability of. If you're at a yacht club and you have some person who's just your outstanding sailor in the group, you know, I think that's a really easy person to pull in and have people relate to and want to listen to and take advantage of. teaching sailing for 35 years and, and written a bunch of curriculum for my school and seen a ton of stuff come through U.S. Sailing. And I find that book um, very pragmatic, very user-friendly, um, and um, uh, very easy <coughs> as an introduction. What Start Sailing Right did that we all got used to, and trust me, we got used to it. It wasn't written well enough for us. Um, um, uh, we got used to the fact that there's a ton of stuff in there that doesn't get used in, in the average intro to sailing course. And what we tried to do with Learn Sailing Right was um, uh, protect the price point and uh, make it so that you were only buying what you needed for that basic course. But, you know, I could, you definitely could argue that uh, it's imperfect. Learn Sailing Right, it's a, a small boat um, introduction to sailing and uh, uh, really aimed at um, youth, not that Youth are the only ones to get dinghy training, but um, majority of dinghy training is for youth. Um, the book that I am really proud of for adult training, um, if it's on keelboats, is the basic keelboat book, and I think that's really well written as well, and uh, according to the same precepts, which is if, if it's not going to get covered in a basic keelboat course, it's not in the book. It's called basic keelboat. Basic keelboat. <laughs> Um, I don't have an answer for it, but I'm right. Um, the, if you go to, to just not that the answer is here, but store.ussailing.org, there are examples there. We can also send you visual flip throughs of a lot of things. Buy a book, look at it. You know. No, I understand. What are things? So you're, you're right in my wheelhouse. Um, the, um, the, uh, the place where the books have always been and always will be will be um, New Orleans, January 25th, 2015, <laughs> the National Sailing Program Symposium. Um, um, so uh, I think you'll all agree that this has been a spectacular event. Uh, but um, those of you who are training wants and have come to symposiums before know that there had to be some compromises in how this uh, program was run in order to do a 600 person, five discipline event. And uh, I'm sure that the training books not being on the desk is just got lost in that case. So come to New Orleans and buy a book. I'm sorry, say that again. I'm Stu Gilson, like Richard said, just very quickly on materials. Uh, US Sailing's in the process of updating our website, and one of the things also with the store is we're going to work on including components that you can flip through and see what the books look like. So to your point about not having the ability to look at it, trust me, I read you loud and clear, and this is something that's on our radar. Um, and I apologize if the books aren't here. Like Rich said, it's not it, definitely coming from me and from this group. It's not something that was an intentional piece. It's just an oversight. Um, one that shouldn't happen, but did, and we're hoping to provide something else that will give you that ability to do it from wherever you're sitting. So, so we have time for uh, one more comment or question. Sorry, wait, that question was, are there any video materials that you can buy and then to help teach 
so so um, uh, on the new web. I'm oh, sorry. On, on the new website, there will be some video clips. Um, uh, uh, they are few and far between. Um, we are um, late, but engaged in a multi-year um, strategic plan to um, join the 21st century in terms of distance learning and flipped classroom and stuff like that. But we are um, uh, behind the eight ball there, and, and uh, I just promise you that uh, you'll see a lot in the next um, two to five years. Um, I'll say, I, I do it all the time. If you Google sailing videos or you Google sailing instruction videos, you will come up with a ton. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, please uh, give us your feedback and uh, just to say Thanks.